So first I want to thank Andy for inviting me. This is a, my first time at this meeting, which is phenomenal. I really had a lot of fun talking to some of you. Um, and uh, I also have the benefit of having heard some other companies speak yesterday, so I kind of the last of them. Uh, so I, then I went uh, to the hotel and shuffled my slides. Uh, in. So I'm not going to be talking a lot about, oh, this product or this other product or I uh, had some slides. I have a few. I have some data slides. But I decided that also being in a, such a beautiful city with deep culture, I'm going to talk more about culture and, and try to explain, if I can, the, the culture of CST, at CST, and what, what made us uh, uh, become what, what we are today in the marketplace. Um, and I have some nuggets that I sort of took to, to try to... Uh, give examples of that, uh, perhaps. Um, so, history. So, uh, you guys know us, I think, of course, we are well known, but I'm not sure you know all the details or you know where we come from. Uh, so, I decided to give you a little bit of history. Uh, so, we are a private uh, company, family-owned, global presence. Private is important in our, hand, in our sense. It's very uh, crucial because you can control your destiny. You're not in the hands of shareholders, and therefore, you can invest for the future and you can do things your way and not being uh, a slave of quarterly reportings. And, and that is important when you really want to invest in science and in, in, in doing things the right way. We were founded by scientists uh, that are still active in research. I still do research. Uh, the founder and CEO of the company still does research and is embarking in other adventures. Uh, we always focus from the beginning of uh, application-driven validation, QC, and technical support. We develop three generations of rapid monotonous technology in-house, and the fourth is underway. 95% um, uh, of the uh, antibodies are monoclonal and are recombinant. Uh, not, not, not monoclonal, but recombinant. Um, uh, and we, made, we sell what we make, essentially. We, we typically are very averse to sourcing stuff from other people. We do have a little bit of that, uh, but very, very limited. So about 95% of the anti development happens inside our walls, and 100% of the manufacturing you see happens in our walls. So uh, we like to control things, uh, uh, maybe too much, but, um, um, and, and we are ISO and that kind of thing. So uh, from a history point of view, so we started in 1999. We spun out of another company. Uh, that uh, called England Biolabs. So if you have done molecular biology, you probably know them. Uh, and our original focus was this type of antibodies called activation state of phosphoantibodies. We're probably the first or one of the first companies to ever do that. And that was a disruptive te technology. We used to use P32 to try to get a sense of phosphorylation in a protein. It was nasty, it was bad, it was uh, radioactive, right? So you don't want to do that. So we, we began doing that quite successfully and things took off. So um, we decided that um, back then, so if we're gonna be in the market, we should discover them. So we should be the first to go and discover what phosphorylation sites, other post-translational modifications are important in cell biology and disease. And we developed technologies to do that. And we developed things to try to annotate them, uh, databases and so forth, and, um, and we got uh, NIH grants uh, to do that at the beginning when we were a small company. And we also decided that we're, we're an antibody company, so then let's invest in methods to really be successful at that. Uh, so, uh, again, the, the, the point was to create value all along. Value, obviously, we're a company, so we need to create value to us, but value to the community, value to the scientific community. Uh, and those tools were very important to map uh, cancer pathways to do cancer research. We created proteomics approaches to do that, to find more of those. But we engage ourselves in cancer research and, and things of that kind in trying to uh, understanding the wiring of a cancer cell and what's different from, from a normal and, a, and, a, and a, a cancer cell. So work of that kind uh, led to this uh, publication. So I'm not sure you're aware of that. But, but this is a cell paper where we essentially screen uh, hundreds of non-small cell lung cancer tumors way back when using proteomics and using phosphotyrosine proteomics, trying to uncover tyrosine kinases that may be the regulator in disease. And we came up with a couple of them that turned to be quite important. 
we discovered the ML4 ALK fusion in, in lung cancer. And independently, in parallel, a Japanese group also discovered the same thing. And actually, they beat us to the publication. They published in Nature, and we published in Cell, and we were both in review, completely independently. And we developed uh, a companion diagnostic that is now sold by Ventana using our rabbit monoclonal technology. The beauty uh, of this, of creating value, the concept of creating value and going back to the, the community is that soon after, these two papers, the Japanese and our paper, uh, got attention by pharma that were developing compounds. And this is what you see today is the result of those discoveries. So we were, again, very pleased to see the vision of investing in research and going back. Uh, so uh, these were, uh, again, approved drugs, uh, all to target uh, both ALK and ROS in lung cancer. Uh, and this is a slide that shows uh, one of the rabbit monoclonal technologies that we created. I'm not going to spend too much time here because it's published. Uh, we published that in two papers in Nature Biotech back in 2012. The, uh, the, uh, the key thing, this was a breakthrough in the sense that it was completely novel, in the sense that we used proteomics, a combination of proteomics and next generation sequencing to essentially map what you find in serum together with the, uh, the, um, uh, the genomes of the B cells uh, uh, that, that create the immunoglobulins and then put it all together to go straight from serum to uh, a, the possibility of making a recombinant antibody without cells. This is uh, essentially technology that is up and running. We've been using it online uh, for most of our pipeline since uh, 2014. And, and technologies like this deliver value again. And these are antibodies uh, like uh, ALK, ROS, more recently PDL1 that are, it's been used in clinical settings to help patients uh, uh, with cancer. And we're also being a very collaborative uh, company, and I, I, I almost said research institute, because we kind of operate that way, uh, for good and bad, I must say. But, uh, and we publish a lot. We like to do that. And we have academic collaborations and industry collaborations. And, and papers like that, for instance, where we really publish with groups here in Boston. Uh, and this is a paper to study the ubiquitin proteome, things of that kind. And these are technologies that we pioneer. And then we engage to have other people use them and make discoveries, and we make our own discoveries as well. So I think that that uh, created a research culture, and, and when you actually do research, and you use antibodies, and you use tools, then you know when some of this, something is good, something is bad, and you, you know how important it is to use tools that are really well characterized and well validated. So uh, in this slide, I, I just want to walk you very briefly through validation principles. And you heard some of them, or, or most of these principles already by many other companies, and this is great. So again, we work on sensitivity. We, we clearly uh, optimize uh, to a, a maximum degree in applications, and we do titrations. We focus on endogenous. We don't like overexpressing things only when it's uh, necessary. Uh, but uh, we like to have tools that detect that uh, endogenous expression. We, of course, do uh, uh, test specificity using the tools that are available today, knockouts, sRNA, more recently CRISPR. Uh, we very, very much focus on this, on trying to screen first for the application you really want. Um, and then consistency. So because everything is done in-house, we can really control it. We know what, what we're making. And it's very easy for us to really maintain a robust uh, uh, QC process, and, 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 and I will show some, some data on that later. Um, so, and this is kind of the process, it's a very high level, uh, so I'm going to just emphasize a few points. So, first is uh, we choose what to make uh, very carefully in terms of need, market need, understanding what you guys need. Uh, our own science, we have a very strong scientific team that is thinking about what to do all the time. Uh, project design, design is a combination of, uh, of course, antigen design, which has been already discussed a little bit, is extremely important. Um, but uh, the combination, again, of the antigen, which application, how this, this tool is going to be used is very important. And then there are a series of steps, like, you know, from the serum. And then, and then the point I want to make here is this, is that we, multiple times through the process, we go back to the different applications. And this is done also by different groups. 
So this serves, serves as an internal control to see whether the data really is supporting the tool that we are developing. And in the last step here, the application testing, this is actually done in a completely different department that is the production department. So once a, an antibody is first released to the market, it now goes to a completely different department that is in charge of making it again and again and again and maintaining that lot-to-lot -lot consistency. And these guys need to approve it before it goes out. So if these guys cannot reproduce it, so they, sell, they serve as a customer. If they cannot reproduce what the, the scientists that developed the tool did, it doesn't go out. So only the best survive. So our, our success rates are not high. And that's uh, uh, something that we constantly strive to, to improve because uh, it's costly. Uh, but on the other hand, this actually guarantees that when we go out with something, we really know what it is and we know what it does and we, we, we know that it will work um, if you use the right protocol. I'll get to that. So now, of course, we have uh, nice images like this that, that, that are now common that were shown by others. I think in this case is a, uh, an example of uh, uh, antibodies to GSK3 and there are alpha and beta isoforms. So this is an antibody that does both, can, can identify both. And then by knocking out or CRISPRing uh, the beta or the alpha, you can show that it needs the antibody specific uh, to one or the other. And, and there is a little difference in the end terminus of this enzyme of this kinase that you can really catch this way. And now I'm going to walk you a little bit through a case study for an IHC uh, campaign um, uh, as another example. So here we are trying to develop an antibody to this OLFM4 uh, protein, which is an important stem cell marker. Uh, it's supposed to be uh, in, in, in humans in uh, small intestine and colon. This is RNA. Uh, here is tissue, a Western blood. And you see that, although you see a little bit of discrepancy here, the colon seems to be stronger than, than the uh, small intestine, negative in a, in a breast cancer cell line. Um, and just I'm going, uh, I'm going to go to every step of the validation, but indeed it's in colon. We got really great images. It's in stage one colon carcinoma, but not so much in stage four. But that's consistent with the literature. With the literature. It was also uh, reproduced and validated by Hans Cleaver's lab. Which, uh, that's a lab expert in this uh, uh, biology. And then we went to uh, make an antibody that reacts against the mouse. And in the mouse, uh, everything was going pretty well. So it's, this is where it's supposed to be. Uh, this is an adenoma and a mean, uh, a mean mutation model, the APC model. So where it's uh, 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 negative in colon, and this is positive in, in the adenoma, in the stem cells. So everything was cool, everything was good, we're ready to go, but we started to see, we, we go beyond that, we go to other tissues, uh, as many as we can get our hands on. So we saw this signal on the spleen, is that right? There's no publications on that, what happens there? So then we engage in a collaboration again with people that had a knockout mouse, and the result is great. Well, it's clean. So it is specific, and it is in spleen. It simply wasn't reported. And this is one of these issues that sometimes you get uh, with not so well characterized proteins, that you get into a biology that is a little bit unknown, and then you have to discover the biology as you develop the tool. And then is it, is it the tool right, or is it the biology? So what is it? So in this case, we're fortunate to be able to prove that it was correct. And that led to a product, and this is from the data sheet. Uh, yeah. So now I'm going to switch to some other topic that came up uh, in the discussions with this uh, antibody benchmarking or using independent antibodies to test uh, whether your antibody is correct or not correct. And we use that. I think every company tries to use it. We encourage uh, uh, researchers to do that. So in this case, uh, but there are some, some issues with that sometimes. So, uh, and that also came up. Uh, I don't remember who said that, but I think Alejandro said that. But if, if the other antibodies are bad, then, then what's the point of benchmarking, right? But, so here we grab uh, an antibody from another vendor, and I don't know who is that. Um, so this is a Phosphostat 5. So it should light up in uh, AML, in CML, in, in, um, uh, and in this case we use a K562 cell line that is a CML cell line, and we are essentially blocking with Gleevec, with Imanitib. So BCR able should be uh, uh, down if you use it, and consider the app if you don't. And actually, I published 
uh, way back a paper using proteomics and characterizing all the signaling of this line, and I don't even remember that anymore. Uh, but in any case, uh, we look at this data and we say, well, hmm, our antibody doesn't look too good. This is a problem. Perhaps it's not so sensitive. This one looks a little bit sensi more sensitive than, than, than the other, and than ours in terms of the mean fluorescent intensity. However, when you run this on a Western block, and that's another important point, which is the cross-application validation. So it's, it's very important to be able to get tools that work in many applications uh, as much as possible. And I get the point that sometimes you may be missing uh, uh, antibodies that are not Western positive, but they may be uh, IF or IFC positive. But in this case, for instance, uh, uh, you, you see this kind of thing with the other antibodies. So what is that? This is a GFR. I mean, this is clearly a GFR. Uh, these are A431 that express a ton of eGFR. And, what, and, and in the K562, what, what this could be is a little bit of this. And essentially, there are a lot of other kinases beyond uh, BCR able. Uh, so this antibody probably is more general phosphotyrosine. And for people who spend time developing those antibodies, phosphotyrosine is very immunogenic. And therefore, uh, to develop a very specific tool for a, I mean, protein-specific tool for a phosphotyrosine is difficult. And you have to be careful uh, and do a lot of controls. And they probably miss that. Uh, so, and, and in fact, you see that when you take that on cells uh, in an IF experiment, this is our tool. And STAT5, when activated, is in the nucleus. And this is very clear membrane EGF receptor. So this antibody is not specific. Um, so uh, now I'm going to show you a little bit of what we do to optimize things in terms of uh, immunofluorescence or ICC or these kind of things. So this is a case of uh, an antibody to c 3 b And all I want to tell you is that we, we spend a lot of time trying to implement high throughput methods. This is a high content study. And we do this routinely, where essentially what we are, we are comparing is we put on one axis fixation protocols and on the other permeabilization protocols. And the combination is critical sometimes to get the antibodies to work. So if you zoom in, uh, you get like, this protocol is OK. I mean, you can get the right signal. The antibody is working, but this is way better. So you get a much stronger signal if you use the right protocol. And it's pretty empirical, so you cannot really guess. You have to really do the hard work of going through all of this. Uh, so we invested in automated ways of doing this, because otherwise it would be very difficult. Uh, and then you get into situations like this, right, that, that come out of that type of work, where you can see that, that fixation methods really matter. So this is right, this is wrong, or not at all uh, works. And there are very sometimes subtle differences in the fixation protocols in this case, and here in permeabilization protocols. And the protocols are not interchangeable. And that's why we spend so much time writing these protocols and publishing them and giving them to customers, because you make a mistake, and then you say the antibody is bad, and Matthias is correct. The antibody is not bad. It's been poorly used in this case. Uh, so please follow the protocols. If not, call. Call us, call AppCamp, call everybody, but please do, because it's important. Uh, because you will get results of this kind. Uh, so finally, uh, this is a nugget that I, I also inserted uh, last night. Um, and this is, um, uh, there was a question about polyclonals um, and whether they're good or bad. And uh, I, I, I don't like them either uh, in the sense that they're hard to reproduce. But you can reproduce them. It's not that you cannot. So we have, we have polyclonals, but we continue to make them, and I'll explain a little bit why. But QC is extremely important because, again, they're hard to reproduce. You inject the rabbit again, and it may not be the same. So you really have to very carefully monitor the rabbits and get the right one and do all the validation pretty much all over again. So it's expensive. It's cheaper to get it to market, but it's very expensive to maintain. Uh, and, and it could be very not reproducible if you're not careful. So uh, this is a kind of old slide, but I like. I show it at a Silomar. So this is, uh, I think, our, one of our very first rabbit polyclonals uh, we ever made. Uh, and this is to phosphor. Uh, so what you see in this panel, this is a Western blot. And this is, we, we, we keep archival samples. So this is a sample we still have from 1999. And these are lots, you know, from the following years that are retired, retired, retired. This slide is from 2016, so 
At that time, this was on deck to be shipped, and we're probably now into 18. Uh, uh, and you can see how consistent that is, that it's a lot of work. Now, he says, well, then why do it? Uh, it's crazy. It's a lot of work. Well, this is why. Uh, so uh, for this particular case, ERC, phosphor ERC, is an important target. Again, one of our first things, the first things we ever made. So this is, uh, it's, it's a famous number uh, in, uh, in house 9101. Everybody knows what 9101 is. That's the catalog number of this polyclonal antibody. Uh, and then these are rabbit monoclonals, uh, all recombinant, that uh, we introduced over the years. We put two in 2004, and this is probably the very best uh, in 2007. Uh, and what you see here, this is total revenue in percentage. I'm not giving you the dollar numbers, but um, the, uh, what you see is that over time, the, this rabbit monoclonal overtook the others, overtook also the other ones, and overtook the polyclonal. So this is 51% of the revenue, but still, the polyclonal is 31% of the revenue. And many people really like it and don't want to change. They want that product. They are loyal to that particular product and we did campaigns and samplers and gave those away. Please convert. They still want that polyclonal. And publications. This is much more published, and I think it's probably now in the over 2,000 publications or so. Uh, and maybe that's why people want to go to those papers and say, I want to use that because I have evidence that it works. So, so this is uh, a problem. What do you do? Uh, we're not going to stop this. We can't. Uh, there are customers that will be very angry at us if we do. Uh, so now uh, I'm going to sort of uh, finish with a story that uh, I think is quite illustrative of, of the reproducibility problem. Uh, and um, so when a negative result solves a controversy. So this is a paper that was published last year, so it appears sometime in February or in January, um, from a group at Harvard. This is the uh, Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary, which is a MGH uh, Mass General Hospital group, uh, Harvard Medical School. So what was the issue here? Well, the issue was that the question whether this inflammasome, the NLRP3 inflammasome, was or not involved in age-related macular degeneration. So it's a big medical problem. And there were some papers that indicated that it was, and some papers that disputed that. So these groups... Uh, so there were results uh, reporting the expression of uh, NLRP3 in uh, retinal pigment epithelium, which is, uh, that's where the problem happens. So, and this may be based, they suspected it may be based on wrong antibodies. So what they did is they went and they bought every possible antibody that was on the market and decided to see whether this protein is indeed expressed in the RPE. So I'm going to show you just two figures from the paper. We are there, and we look good, so that's what I'm showing. Uh, it's true, but uh, what can I do? It's not our paper. So you go and... So this is figure one, uh, and as, uh, there are two key figures. This is one, um, and, you can, and I, I, I blinded the other folks. We are here. This is our data. I, I didn't want to... Uh, wait controversial. So I just blinded the other one. So now from this you can see a few things already. Uh, first of all, let's see, the, this protein is 118 kilodaltons. So it's a Western world experiment. So you expect a band at 118 kilodaltons. You should see that. Well, you can see that this, 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 and this, and this, they don't have it. So yeah, you can argue maybe the antibody is not good for Western blood and it's good for something else, perhaps. But they clearly don't. The other thing you can see is that, uh, I'm not sure about these two, but this, this, and this are the same antibody, right? It's simply diluted a little bit or exposed a little bit more around, but it's, uh, it's clearly the same antibody. Now, uh, I'll get to this later, but this, these two uh, seem to be okay. So they detect the antibody at the right band, but um, uh, to explain you more the experiment, so you what you have here is mouse spleen, you have raw cells that are, that are essentially rodent uh, macrophages, and THP1 is a common human macrophage cell line. Uh, so human, I think it's mouse, and it has to be induced by LPS. And here is a spleen from a wild-type or knockout animal. 
So uh, again, this seems fine. It's induced by LPS. It doesn't see the human. At least it's not sensitive enough to see the human. And you cannot tell anything about the mouse. Maybe species is an issue here. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, uh, show the species. Now, you go back to this one here, and it has a right band. But look at this. It's actually induced by the knockout. So it cannot be, right? So uh, these are essentially the different companies. So this and this are from the same company. Uh, then what? Uh, there were a couple. Uh, this and this. And, uh, uh, C and C, right? This is the same company. Uh, both bad. Uh, B and B are bad. Or, well, this is not that bad, but not sensitive or not, not, not useful to determine the problem here, to determine, not sensitive enough to see, and you'll see in the next slide. Uh, and and this, is, this is, again, wrong. And this is ours, which, again, is, is faint in this figure with a low exposure, but the knockout, with the knockout, is gone. And the right band, the right place, induced by LPS. So bingo, we got it. We got it right. Uh, and again, this is a higher exposure of the same, so it's here, and this is this one, which clearly is induced by the knockout, which is really weird. Uh, so the conclusion is only one antibody, likely ours, uh, and, uh, and this one actually was relatively new because uh, it's, a, it's a relatively new product for us, and um, I don't know why, but um, maybe because we cannot do that many antibodies when we are so careful, and the other eight antibodies were not specific or sensitive enough. Uh, so, and this is an experiment on the sensitivity. So here you have uh, a Western blood with uh, different dilutions of the THP1 cells. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if Jason is here, Jason Lee, uh, but he will like this. And uh, uh, I think they get to a conclusion that it can be up to uh, around 10 nanogram. You have to squint to see it. Uh, but, and here is the killer experiment. It says here they, they pull down the NLRP3 in the cell line, and then they go to the primary tissue where the, where the key thing should be. So, and the, here they use a, a, you know, a milligram to pull it down, and it's, it's not there. So clearly the protein is not expressed in that tissue, therefore this uh, NLRP3 inflammasome is not involved in AMD, the controversy is solved. And that's what a good tool does. And this is a happy face because the, uh, actually when I got the paper, I ran into the, uh, the development scientist at CST, a PhD person who saw it. I showed it, hey, have you seen this, Emily? She had a smile like this. Uh, <laughs> I mean, this pride, right? Uh, she should be. Uh, so I'm going to finish a half night just almost done. Ah, almost done. So, so uh, this is a, if I try to come up with an outline or a series of bullets of what made CST approach successful is the culture and uh, the research behind it and the culture to, to do things and uh, the right way. So the science and the product design lead the project to its right conclusion. And by right, I don't mean that we have to get it. Right means that sometimes we don't get it and, and, and we, we don't have data supporting that the tool is working properly. So we don't ever release such an antibody. We don't have any hardwire timelines per project, so we take the time, it, the time needed to ensure it's right. Um, um, and also, we don't have any hardwire budget per project, so we don't say, okay, you have to, you can only spend this much. Uh, we don't cut corners, so we get it or we don't get it. If we don't get it, too bad, we move on, uh, but we, we are not trying to push it. Uh, so, and, and this is a very important part, is. Uh, all these projects are owned, so there is a PhD scientist that owns the projects, and their reputation is at stake. So they don't want to see, they like to see those papers, they don't want to see the opposite, where they had a product and they were in the other part of the figure. They will hate that. And uh, so uh, there's a very deep sense of ownership that I think makes uh, this culture work uh, nicely. So there is a solid science and technology across the board, and we have an uncompromising business ethics that uh, uh, and we, we don't like uncertainty. Uh, and I just uh, pick it up, uh, this from nature, it just appeared, it's very, very cool. Sorry, madam, I'm afraid we can give refunds on this item because once the box has been opened, right? And this is the uncertainty box, right? The, the cat is there or isn't there. You don't want to play that game with antibodies, right? So, uh, and in the end, it results in things like this. So we, are, we put a lot of emphasis in the materials we develop and we use. Uh, in the methods and in mentoring. And 
um, essentially uh, the materials uh, uh, give us the specificity, the sensitivity, the consistency, the stability, all the processes, the QC, the manufacturing. We pay a lot of attention so the materials are right. Um, uh, we, we try to mentor, we teach. I think that one of the key problems of reproducibility is the, the lack of education. I think that the academic institutions and all of us as a community are failing with young graduate students and postdocs in teaching them good experimental methods. And then we try to compensate with really very good technical support and talking to the right experts in the company, application experts, and doing, doing the, um, uh, the extra work of, of really training uh, and trying to solve the problems when they have one. And we tend to collaborate a lot, which is probably pretty good. Uh, so we like to say that we're rooted in science uh, and um, uh, this is a marketing thing, of course, right? But uh, I, I like it, so I put it there. Thank you. Well, it's both affinity and, and how much of the target is in, in, in the cells or tissues, right? Um, yeah, but I mean, if you've got the same amount of antibodies in the tissue, but you have two different antibodies, one is more sensitive, is that purely a reflection of the affinities, do you think, or is it some other feature? Uh, I think it would be. Yeah, that would be probably a key. Mm -hmm. But the issue with these um, rabbit monoclonals is that extremely high affinity. Extremely, they're not extremely pharma-wise, but they come out of the animal in the sub-nanomolar uh, range. So that's our experience, I think, that uh, in, the, in the 100 picomolar range, they're, they're typically, the yeah. Yeah, congratulations to your NAT3 antibody, uh, really good uh, work. Uh, following up what Jason was uh, uh, talking about uh, yesterday, that's all about the antigen. Not three is a particular uh, difficult uh, antigen to make because the whole pharmaceutical Which industry, one? the LRLP3, uh -huh. yeah. um, the whole pharmaceutical industry uh, failed on that one over years. Yeah. Um, that's a pi domain which you can uh, do, but with an art domain, the uh, so don't ask me what, what antigen we use because that I don't know. Exactly I, my question. That was exactly your question? Yeah. I don't know. I, I not, not, not that I, I, I we, we do know, of course, but I happen not to know because I didn't do the project. Uh, but um, I, I really don't know. Uh, but we can find out. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, but there are, there are, yeah. Well, what would be the difference in your process compared to other companies? Well, uh, first of all, there can be a difference in the antigen, the way you, you and it, there's not a lot of real estate, clearly, right? So it's a peptide, and you can only go a little bit this way, this way. Uh, but there are some, 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 some tricks there. Uh, but I think that the key issue is how you validate them. So it's the attention to detail. It's really making sure that uh, you under in the case of a phosphotyrosine, we have a ton of experience with that, so we understand that there's many pitfalls. And what are the controls and the uh, validation studies that you have to do in order to find the right antibody? Um, I think it's that, most than anything, is knowing what experiments to do uh, to, uh, to know if you have a good tool. So you the validation. Yeah, the it's the validation, most of it, yeah. But it starts very early because you get your rabbits and then you have to test them and then you have to figure out which one is correct before you, you don't want to pursue a wrong one or a not so good one. And, and so having your validation study design up front to know what are you going to do uh, is very important and experience. Would it be 
possible to bring polyphenols uh, on the level of, of monophenols if you just think about it as a uh, combination of monophenols. If you identify, for example, for a show epitope, I would assume that there are not hundreds of single uh, monophenol monopho antibodies, but probably five to six that you could recombinantly combine to reproduce a polyphenol uh, preparation of antibodies that would be then Yeah. Would that be a way to overcome this prejudice of polyphenols being bad? Um, Either it's, it's, it's a way to overcome it and to maintain it to some extent. So, well, you're right in this sense. So, uh, typically these are hyperimmunized animals, so the polyclonal response is not so polyclonal in the end. So, they are, uh, and we have done a lot of sequencing, so we know pretty well, um, you know, how many families you get, things of that kind. It varies, of course, but um, uh, they're, they're more oligoclonal by the time you get to that. Uh, and yes, you can do that. You can mix, and we have done that too. There are products that are mixtures uh, when it justifies that. Um, but then you also maintain the uh, myth of, uh, uh, I'm being controversial now, the myth of the polyclonal. And you can call them out. Say, yeah, you, you could. But the yeah, that's a way. Of, if people want to have that because they want a combination, you can. You have, but it's also time-consuming to get all these monoclonals, characterize them all, and put them all together. Yes. Right, but then you have to characterize each individual one to make sure that you don't introduce some sort of non-specificity to your mix. Uh, you, this can be done. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Got one more question. Yeah, it's again, uh, a good, good talk. Um, the, it's the monoclonals against the polyclonals again. Um, I mean, you're obviously <laughs> developing technologies to make very high quality recombinant monoclonal antibodies. Uh, and uh, being a businessman as well as a scientist, you're obviously not just pouring the money away, right? So, I mean, you see it as advantageous, evidently, to generate recombinant um, type antibodies. And I think you know many of the audience sort of support the idea that recombinants are basically uh, immortal and definable, which is a, you know an issue, obviously, in, in, in the community. So I mean, I, you're still supporting your 9101, for example. I mean. You know, a CSC at some stage can say, you know, have a website which says we don't do polyclonals anymore. I mean, how do you see things going? Because it's sort of, it really is sort of a uh, schism in the uh, in the community. And, uh, I think we all know the advantages of polyclonals, and we all know the advantages of the common antibodies. So I'm really interested in your take on it. Well, I mean, you heard like uh, Alejandro said, Upcom just not, it's not make, you're not making any more polyclonals. And no, new ones, new ones. Yeah, they're not, the they're not making the new ones. Okay. Right. Saying we cannot just stop producing the ones that people love. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so we haven't gone to that extreme of saying no new polyclonals. Um, we have shifted dramatically, and this is years ago, dramatically to, to monoclonals and to recombinant because it's so much better, reproducible, consistent, easy to make, everything. Uh, but um, you start with the polyclonal always. So uh, in a sense that you have a rabbit, you have serum, you characterize, you, you, so you know, you, you can always be faster to market with a polyclonal if we, uh, and if we characterize and we feel confident about that and there is a market need, uh, then we will still release it. So at least that's our policy so far. But I could see a day where we completely stop, uh, but we haven't done that. But we, uh, if you look at our numbers of products released over the years, the polyclonals have shrunk tremendously, and the mo that's almost not all, but maybe 80% is, is, is monoclonal. Yeah. Uh, 